I see. Let us know where you guys are coming from. Ken, I was, um, you know, the book, have you read the book, um, uh, with the one that, uh, Michael Lewis wrote about, um, Amos Tversky and, and, uh, Daniel Kahneman. I can't remember what it's called now. Anyway, the undoing project, that's what it's called. And, mm -hmm. uh, in an interview, Michael Lewis said, I felt really weird writing this because I was the B student writing about a students. Um, and now, now I'm hosting this with you. I feel like the B student talking to the A student, but I'm, I'm going to do my best. I told you I edit my emails to you more than I edit to most people. That's probably annoying to you, but. Um, yeah, then again, um, I'm the guy on Twitter who adopts uh, affectations of people 40 years younger in terms yeah. of erratic capitalization and spelling and what have you. So. You too could be president. Yeah, my uh, daughter this morning, I referred to Instagram as the Graham and she proceeded to mock me for 30 minutes. So yeah, uh, yeah. we're getting those things wrong. So uh, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're about to start with Ken. Before we do that, I want to give you a, a little... Um, a little bit of, uh, oh, I had the Andrew Goldberg asked to turn off allowing attendees. Andrew, I would note that this, this chat feature, we're just using it right now, but that chat feature is going to be used throughout the conversation. Uh, so we're going to leave that open. Guys, here's how this will work. Ken and I are going to have a conversation, but there are a lot of you, and you guys will have a lot of questions and a lot of thoughts. So there are two features that I want you to get familiar with. They're at the bottom of your screen. One is the chat feature. Over there, you guys can talk about whatever related to what Ken's talking about, how it applies to you, how it works in your situation. We often have good heated debates on that side about practice. The Q&A feature is to actually ask a question of Ken. And what I would ask you guys to do is as you see questions pop up in that, upvote them. So we know which ones you're interested in hearing as well. That will help me to filter through those. So as we go through this, uh, just add some upvotes to the questions. Uh, a few business items to cover real quick. Uh, one, there will be a survey at the end of this. We're trying to figure out what you guys want to hear from us. So if you can hang out at the end of this, it'll prompt you automatically to go over to a survey. Uh, a bunch of you signed up for a presentation around how do you use Law Insider. We'll be sending information about that soon, so keep an eye out for that. And finally, if you got, as we're doing these sessions, we want to pull from the community as well. So that requires you guys raising your hand to say that you wanna contribute, you wanna share your thoughts. So if you could just email community at lawinsider.com, we'll be able to reach out to you and see if we can have conversations with you about whatever deep subject you wanna get into. You can also contribute to the blog as you, you know, practice and learn some things. So let's get started. Um, I am Mike Whalen. I wrote a book called Lawyer Forward, which you can see conveniently positioned back there. Uh, I also host a podcast called Lawyer Forward. It is storytelling applied to some legal issues. I did an episode on cancel culture the other day, which if you're not in the United States, you might not know how hot a word that is, um, a phrase that is. So uh, check out the Lawyer Forward podcast. I am here with Ken Adams, who likely needs no introduction, um, but he is the author of many books and the teacher of many lessons, the teller of many tales. Ken, here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm going to turn a little time over to you to sort of set the background. What are we talking about? Why do you think this is important at this moment? And then you and I'll pivot and have some conversation about application. Is that all right? If I give you a few minutes to give us some background thoughts? Absolutely. All right, go Thank ahead. Thank you, Mike. Hey, I have covers of two editions of my book behind me. I guess you always got to have the book behind Positioning. you. Positioning, so right. That's right. Um, so, um, yes, I, uh, I blithely disregarded the instructions Mike gave me several weeks ago in terms of, ah, you might want to have a presentation, but um, I think this topic is conducive to a conversation, and I don't often get to converse with someone like Mike, who kind of, you know, who's uh, been around and, and is in the same sort of racket that I am. So I want to have a conversation, darn it, rather than a PowerPoint presentation. So we'll see how that goes. Let's hope uh, we don't all come to regret that. Um, I am a contract drafting guy. Um, I, um, 
I was a foot soldier in the big law world until in the in the 1990s at some point I had some uh, uh, transformative experience a bolt of lightning said instead of just doing deals why not look at how contract language works or does not work um, that had me veering uh, radically off the the predicted trajectory uh, go heading off across country I uh, started devoting more and more of my time to 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 that subject um, it reached its logical conclusion around 15 years ago when I stopped practicing law the regular way and devoted myself to my full time to my grand passion for contract language. Yes, I know that sounds kind of sad. Great but, at parties, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, so I've sort of been in a cave for a while, like 20 years, um, uh, working away at this subject. Um, while you know, cheerfully you know, go traveling around the world, uh, proselytizing, uh, just giving seminars. But the foundation for what I do is a book called A Manual of Style for Contract Drafting, first published in 2004. It's now in its fourth edition. It has grown alarmingly. Now it's a handsome hardcover book suitable for cracking walnuts, you know, 600 pages on how to say clearly in a contract whatever you want to say. That's distinct from the challenge of what do you say in a contract, which is a different and ultimately bigger undertaking. And it just says a whole universe of, in terms of what you say, but the starting point is how to say clearly whatever you want to say. So, um, uh, that's the foundation, but it was always a means to an end. And the end is just a more rational approach to the contracts process. Um, well, let's, I, it, interestingly, what first Stephanie mentioned in the comments that uh, your shtick is great at this party and that's what matters. Fred uh, asked the question, are we going to actually talk about contracts I think that's actually an important question. So let's get to that part of the background. We're going to talk about your training program and, and sort uh -huh. of solving some of these problems, but let's set the stage first for what's so bad, right? <sighs> Why do we care? It, sometimes if I'm a practitioner and I'm trying to get deals done, these conversations about specific provisions and contracts and change in this language, as long as there's a meeting of the minds, who cares? Let's just get the deal done. It's hard to make these things present for people how do you make this present for people? How do you make this? What, what's the who cares okay. answer to this? Yeah, by the way, in terms of what we're talking about, I was uh, in our initial discussions, I was eager to have people realize that when we're talking about tra training, it's not as if I'm going to now provide training in uh, the, the, the basics of, okay, contract language. No, this is, it's, it's, it's largely going to be a broad conversation about the notion of tr providing training. But the, indeed, the, the foundation is kind of what's, what, what are we trying to do with training? And the, the, the stark reality that one, has to, that one has to work from is that traditional contract language is dysfunctional. Um, you know, easily said, what does that mean? in terms of how you say what you want to say. Um, contract, the process of creating contracts is precedent driven. When you need to uh, create a contract for a new deal, gen generally people root around to look for examples of uh, pre contracts used in previous deals. So precedent driven. Um, and given the, the pace of the transactional world, what that essentially results in is copy and paste. Um, and that's, that's a exacerbated by the, the limited and stylized and technical nature of the language. So people are just, don't have the time, the authority, the expertise to say, okay, I'm gonna make sure this new contract I'm doing based on these other old contracts is as relevant and clear as can be. Instead, um, 
we copy and paste on faith from precedent contracts of questionable quality and relevance. Um, and when, if you have generations doing that, there, you acquire a disconnect between what is in the contract and what people think is in the contract. It's just the, the it's a demanding field and people are just not equipped for those very, for various reasons to, to embrace the complexity. They just want to get the job done. Um, mm. So, so there's, so it is a, it, it, the, it's the system, man. You know, there are a lot of, it's, it's a, an activity with all sorts of smart people pre- generating products that is uh, just uh, stupid. I, I don't want to appear a crank, but I think I've, I've shown any, just I, I've spent decades by now just pointing at, pointing at the dysfunction and saying, look how preposterous this is. And in fact, my, my live seminars have a kind of slapstick quality to some, to some parts of it because it just, the stuff can be so preposterous as to make it entertaining to talk about, but, but it is not entertaining to live it because you waste time, you waste money in drafting, in reviewing and negotiating and monitoring performance. You have to hack your way through the jungle or you know, grope your way through the fog. And in the process, uh, you, it hurts your competitiveness. And then they're going to, they're going to be circumstances where um, you don't get what you expected to get under the contract. And if you ever, if people are unhappy enough about that, they're going to fight about that. And in a, in a world where contracts matter and where you have access to justice and certainly none of neither of those is to be taken for granted but we're sort of at that stage still um people can get into all sorts of full-blown public messy fights and as i i did in a blog post that that i ran by you a blog post yesterday i observed that that the mess continues in dispute resolution where judges aren't equipped to understand what's going on. So you have, you have just pe- people just kind of fumbling through the motions at every stage in the process because the language, because the, the because the, the, the topic, the, the, what needs to be said is complicated because the stakes are high, but people are just not equipped to handle that for, for various reasons. Now that's okay. So uh, there's the copy and paste angle. There's also um, the legalistic mindset that comes into play. So, all right, it's a, it's a, it's a fiendish um, kind of writing. So we know that it's made worse by the fact that you have, well, lawyers, lawyers for reasons that don't really have much of a bearing on the work. Um, lawyers have made contracts mostly their own. Um, I think that's most, it, it resembles the way lawyers have, have glommed onto uh, um, lobbying, for example. It just that they're good at staking out turf. So lawyers have made contracts their own uh, or largely their own. And um, uh, even though there's relatively little in contracts that is purely legal and it tends to be the most boring stuff like the, you know, oh, jurisdiction provisions and the like. Uh, any you know, business people, contract managers, Others should be as equipped to handle contract language, to wrangle contract language as lawyers, but lawyers have, have, have got hold of it. So the legalistic mindset does things like, hmm, we're risk averse. Which of these five words do we use? I don't know, I'm risk averse, let's use all five. And then the legalistic mindset also relishes 
complexity, relishes hair splitting. Ah, well, there are these five words. There must be some distinctive function for each of those five words. Let us retrofit that distinctive function. So that just adds an extra layer of heinousness to the, to the process um, with people just dickering over stuff that does not make sense. Mm. So there. Yeah. Yeah, and let's, um, I had a couple of questions. One from Michelle asking, what are the key topics for today? And Andrew asking for a roadmap of where we're going. So uh, I'm gonna propose something to you, Ken, and you tell me if this yes. matches with what you think we, we talked about. You know, broadly right now, we're talking about the why this matters, right? And yes. then we're gonna talk about a solution to the dysfunction, including creating a training program that might involve using yours. So if, if I'm in that position, I, I guess, what are the tangible risks of if I'm an attorney, there's the old cliche that uh, nobody ever get, got disbarred for citing Westlaw, right? Um, and so I feel a little bit like if I'm a practitioner and I'm looking to do a good job and maintain my license and you know do, do the bare minimum of, of, of quality that I have to do, then a copy paste strategy is not terrible, right? That, that gets the job done, it checks the box, you get the deal done. I, I guess what I'm wondering is why, if I'm watching this conversation, why should I be worried? Why should I be scared of getting this wrong? It's a matter of deciding what your priorities are. Um, if your priorities are um, not sticking out, um, not, um, now, not drawing attention to yourself, not challenging the conventional wisdom. If you're looking to blend in with the herd, copy and paste can work can work okay in the in the short term. But ultimately, if stuff doesn't work well, there can be enough instances of um, of things blowing up down the road, where bad bad choices. Um, result in unhappiness. It can be um, contract drafting is the kind of activity where a choice like um, oh, uh, using an uh, includes definition, uh, widget includes X, that implies, oh, there might be other stuff that widget can mean. Well, maybe we'll deal with that later. And lo and behold, that becomes the call, uh, that is at the heart of seven years of litigation that Mattel was involved in over ownership of, of uh, rights to Bratz dolls. So, so these choices, even, as, even, even unexceptional choices can end up in in major unhappiness, uh, 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 the billion dollar gil deal goes bad and people are fighting over um, the meaning of willful termination. Or you can end up, uh, or the Delaware Chancery Court can end up having to moderate a fight over whether execute an agreement means sign it or perform under the agreement. There are all sorts of pit hole, uh, well, pitfalls um, for the unwary for the unparanoid. So, um, so yes, uh, if you're looking to not rock the boat, doing the copy and paste thing is fine. If you want an optimal outcome, if you want to serve your business, serve your clients ultimately better, if you want to be able to look out for yourself, then being an informed consumer of contract language is is the key. Uh, it, it is not for everyone. Um, if if your role is as a cog in a big law M and A machine, for example, uh, few people are going to be too too uh, interested, or they're not going to expect you to uh, to offer refined uh, suggestions on on this or that bit of verbiage so um, it's up to it, it's up to any given and anyone working with contracts to decide whether it is relevant to them to be an informed consumer of contract language
Mm. Yeah, and uh, but we got a question from Ching Kit Chow. She uh, says, hi, Ken, will AI technologies replace lawyers' role in legal drafting? If so, what other roles can a lawyer take? I think maybe part of this to make it as you know, personal and present as possible. If you can train a lawyer one time to copy paste something and then they can do it over and over again, that is the kind of activity that is ripe for being taken over by technology. So is there, do you feel like there's a threat from technology if we continue to practice this way? Let's see. Um, I mean, that's, in terms of, in terms of our syllogism, um, in terms of how I'd, how I'd explain this, I'll just explain it in brief now, and then we can, you can decide how we, how we handle it. Um, if, you want to work, if you want to work in a rational way with contracts, I say that the foundation is understanding how to say clearly whatever you want to say. Mm. And that, and, and I'm working to offer, well, I already offer of training in the form of, hey, here's the book, here's the blog, here's the seminar. I just launched um, a, a, an expanded online training program called Drafting Care Contracts Masterclass. I will continue to expand, uh, seek to expand that kind of training uh, to establish an ecosystem. And we can revisit, discuss what that what that ecosystem might look like. Um, but that is all a matter of uh, mastering that one task. Um, but as I will have, you know, as I requested that we signal in the title, training, <clears throat> training isn't enough because making people informed consumers of contract language isn't going to work in a copy and paste world. Mm. So uh, you have to provide, um, you have to give people an alternative to the copy and paste machine. Uh, so uh, automation plays an important part there, but I think it's going to be, it's going to come in a couple of different ways. One is, okay, you need to help people create contracts. So I've, I've seen discussion of, of, artificial intelligence being involved in contract drafting, I, I don't, well, I don't buy it. Uh, how, uh, how, how to express this in a nuanced way. Uh, for, as a general matter, um, I found preposterous the notion that the machines will tell us how to draft properly because all the machines know how to do is take what is out there um, turn it into a mulch and, and extract uh, components. And they can tell you, oh, this is, this is the most popular way of saying X. But in, in the world of traditional contract drafting, you can pretty much guarantee that that is going to be a lame way of saying whatever it is. Just mm -hmm. because I've just endlessly take a scalpel to traditional drafting. It's this when you, when you finish making all the big fixes and the many small fixes, you end up with something that's totally different. So the machines cannot tell us what, um, cannot tell us what to draft. So, so just the idea that you can let loose AI technology on contracts and they'll do the job for you just doesn't doesn't play, it doesn't pan out. Um, expertise is essential. Uh, I suggest that the, the, uh, the best protection against being made obsolete is expertise, because that is, uh, that is a, a precious commodity in a commodified world. Hmm. Um, now, AI, the separate, the, the, there's another component we can talk about, uh, also is there is a role for artificial intelligence uh, in reviewing um, because uh, if anything, reviewing contracts is a more demanding task than drafting. Because if I do 10 deals um, based on my 10, 10 uh, iterations of a particular kind of deal and I use my template, uh, you know, it's, you just keep churning out 
uh, slightly different versions of your template. If by contrast, you're on, you are on the receiving end of 10 different drafts by 10 different counterparties, that is, uh, that's much more work. So it's helpful to have an extra pair of eyes and you can have AI software that scans looking for a list of issues and says these, these issues are absent, these issue are, issues are present and uh, offers help text. Um, it so happens that I'm involved with a, a company that uh, offers just that kind of product called Legal Sifter. And lo and behold, <laughs> you have you have the exclusive. Um, I've just become an, an employee of Legal Sifter. Shocking concept. Uh, moi, an employee, but it's not how you're going to live in a cave now. No, um, I've, I've had to deal with people. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, to again, pulling to that practical, Eric asked the question that I think is really helpful. He said, while I've read your book and generally agree with your approach, as a former litigator, I saw that most disputes were due to poorly drafted statements of work and specifications, both of which are typically drafted by domain experts, i.e. non-lawyers. So if, if we're going through this effort of be creating a training system because we believe that expertise matters, what do we do with the real world situation where we're not even the ones writing this stuff? Uh, let's see. Um, I am not. Uh, I'm not qualified to to speak about uh, you know, disputes over statements of work, really, because uh, they, they do tend to be um, they tend to be very fact specific and not so much geared to failures to say whatever you want to say accurately, but just just disputes over just where the trend, what the people parties had in mind. There can be very different sources of, of contract disputes uh, for all sorts of different reasons. In some, uh, I, I've, I've long fantasized about having, doing a study of some, some body of litigation, some jurisdiction, some mass of umpteen thousands of contract disputes and figuring out, okay, what were they fighting over? My attention is limited to fights over people failing to say clearly whatever they wanted to say and getting into, so getting into fights over meaning, over something ambiguous and so on. Um, and there's plenty of that around. So um, I don't, I'm not offering a panacea for a, some sort of cure-all for contract disputes. Instead, I just observed that the found, that the, the foundation of, of sensible contracting is saying clearly whatever you want to say. And if you don't, then you can get end up in all sorts of disputes, um, getting beyond disputes over, oh, uh, what does this exact sentence mean? But disputes over broader deal interests. You know, what are we trying to do here? If you create enough of a fog, all sorts of, all sorts of stuff tends to fall apart. So, so uh, it's just, if you want to write a novel in, in any language, first you have to learn how to say, may I have a cup of tea or you just, you have to, you have to, you have to know the language. And if you don't know the language, then all bets are off in terms of, in terms of what you want to accomplish. So that's a long way of, of answering the, the, the question, which is that um, this is not a narrow uh, frame of reference. It's just if you just successful contracting requires people understanding what's going on, be able, be able to articulate what they have in mind. Um, and uh, so, it, uh, so it's, it's not just, oh, can we escape narrow technical problems? Mm. Well, I'm getting questions on here and I want to be responsive to these. Um, a few requests that we get more, um, I don't know, substantive is the word or tactical is the word. I think uh, we might have expected that that, that would happen. Um, so if I can, uh, you are doing a contract course, right? You yes. sat down and you figured out this is what's wrong with the contract ecosystem writ large, yes. but specifically with the way we write contracts, this project, right, of writing yes. a contract. So with that said, you've 
tried to fill that gap with this course, what are the broad subjects that you think are the most poignant for practitioners to deal with right away, which I'm assuming correlates with what you're teaching in this course? Yes. Um, let's see. Um, there are, as with any, whenever English usage is, is the topic, you can divide it into um, just a range of different areas of concern. Some of the stuff I talk about is is very is very obvious. Uh, like, okay, w why do we have to have contracts look like they have, they they have elements from five hundred years ago? You know, whereas and in witness whereof and so on. Okay, let's get rid of that. That's easily done. Um, but then, then uh, getting deeper into it requires all sorts of analysis by me to get away to 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 dis, to, to um, show why the conventional wisdom doesn't make sense so there's uh let's see my the the topic that i regard as the foundation of control drafting is what i call the categories of contract language that is uh, the idea that uh, of how you use verb structures to convey different kinds of meaning. Because in traditional contract drafting, people use random verb structures. It just, they're just making stuff up. So um, for example, in my book, well, the, the categories are uh, you know, language of performance, obligation, discretion, prohibition, policy, declaration, and so on, each trying to convey a different kind of meaning. Take discretion. Uh, that's where you say that a, that a party may do something. But I have tables in my book that say, okay, here's a uh, language of discretion, may. All right, here's an example with may. Then I have probably 15 examples that use other wordier and sometimes outlandish ways of saying may. Instead of ACME may appoint, you could say ACME is authorized to appoint. Why use th three words instead of one? Or uh, Widgetco hereby grants ACME the right to appoint. Why use 10 words instead of one? Endless, endless inconsistency, consistency, endless people making stuff up. So I want to have a kind of more software code approach to it. Here is the kind of meaning we're looking to convey. Here is the verb structure to use rather than endlessly winging it. Because it's just once you look closely, there's all sorts of bizarre features like um, ACME undertakes that ACME shall. The ACME undertakes part is what I call throat clearing. It's a redundant verb structure that's stuck in front of the verb structure we care about. All we care about is ACME shall. All right, you're stating an obligation. ACME undertakes that ACME shall, or ACME represents, warrants, and comes and agrees that ACME shall. All the stuff in front is throat clearing. Hey, it looks like it's a contract, but only once you're an informed consumer do you say, that stuff at this front, we don't need, and people have gotten into fights over that stuff. So we purge it. It's, it, it, um, this is, you know, I know it's a world where people like tips, and I, have occasionally observed, I got tips. I got 3,522 tips in that just it involves being aware of the endless deficiencies and deciding which you need to fix, which you can live with. And in your templates, there's no reason why you have to live with anything. You fix it all. So that is, that's the foundation. We have to, to, to understand what I'm trying to say, what verb structures I'm going to use, because otherwise I'm just going to have a random approach and I'm going to create a fog or I'm going to get into fights over, oh, is this an obligation? Well, it looks like an obligation. Really, it's a condition um, saying that, oh, if you want this to happen, you have to, this has, the other thing has to happen first. People get into fights over that. So, so that is, that's an example of how things matter. Then beyond that, there are hot button phrases like, okay, efforts provisions. You know, I could have, we could kind of have done a detour here and said, uh, 
Oh, by the way, regarding categories of contract language, if you search on my blog for the phrase quick reference, you will find um, my blog post that contains a link to a four page chart that's in the book that just summarizes the categories of contract language and it will give you a sense of what that's about. Quick reference. But then efforts provisions. Efforts provisions have loomed large in my life. I've written about them um, for many years, culminating last year in the law review article. You can find that on my website. Uh, there's a writing menu item. The drop downs will include articles and in the last three articles or so, you'll find my law review article on efforts provisions. And it's the only, the only uh, attempt to, to, to offer a reasoned analysis because again, in traditional contract drafting, it is chaos. There is conventional wisdom. Uh, people who work with contracts the world over buy into the notion that different levels of efforts provisions involve different levels of onerousness. So, um, you know, oh, best efforts, uh, you have to do everything you possibly can. Reasonable efforts, oh, just what's reasonable. And then there are all reasonable efforts or commercially, there, there's a whole kind of buffet of alternatives. Uh, the conventional wisdom is those, yes, that exists. Uh, it, it's real. But on the other hand, U.S. courts say, uh, no thanks. It all means reasonable efforts, including Delaware courts. It all means reasonable efforts, no gradations. Um, and and a, a wealth of other U.S. case law to the same effect. So we have a pretty bizarre disconnect between what people work with contracts think and what courts have said. On the other hand, English courts, Canadian courts have bought into the distinction. My article says as so categorically that now I am I am at peace with the subject is that it does that it makes no sense um, uh, as a matter of contract logic as a matter of semantics as a matter of how people speak it includes trendy corpus linguistics analysis just showing that colloquially we t best efforts uh, and in England best endeavors is is Everyday English, reasonable efforts is not. It's a legal invention. So, so the, the ostensible distinctions collapse, collapse in front of your eyes. The bottom, the bottom line is I say, use only reasonable efforts because best promises more than it can deliver. It's an easy fix. Someone asks you, oh, reasonable isn't enough. Well, I'd say, what, you want me to act unreasonably? You know, we, what more than reasonable do you want? If you can't be specific about it, um, no thanks. So, so you, those, you, you yeah. bring up, you bring up a question that's, that's come up a couple of times. Laura asks, how do you approach negotiating with counterparties who are stuck in the traditional way of contract drafting and are resistant to a simpler, plainer language approach? Um, and got a similar question uh, that, that basically asked if you are, if you're dealing with another party, uh, Patrick here. I'm interested in Ken's thoughts on etiquette of contract negotiation. Much of his manual of styles of rebuke to traditional dysfunctional contract language. In your perspective, does this dysfunction also manifest in negotiation? So let's say you do what you're talking about and you're trying to get the language right and you care about this and you care about the craft. If the other side doesn't, what's the relationship there? Yeah. Oh, by the way, I saw a comment, someone saying, hey, what about you know more reasonable efforts information, a link to my law review articles on my website. Now, okay, how do you handle this with counterparties? <sighs> okay, well, hey, in theory, people should not be annoying when they review your draft, but you know, the, you know uh, lawyers being lawyers, that isn't uh, always going to play out. Um, one strategy is try to get your, tr try to let people know what you're doing. So uh, the preface to my book, the fourth edition has uh, I, my fantasy email cover note that says, here's a draft. It complies with guidelines and manual style for contract drafting. Please don't waste your time and hours by um, just trying to make our draft look more like stuff you're used to seeing. So that can, that can help, um, help limit the annoying pushback you get 
um, because once once comments are made, then you know that 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 just that's when it gets annoying. So if you can preempt that, so much the better. Um, <clears throat> I've had enough readers tell me that the book itself is helpful uh, because uh, having people on opposite sides of the table just uh, haggling over usages based on uh, inefficient information, just uh, well, uh, lack of expertise is unpromising where you get, oh, best efforts. No, impossible, reasonable efforts. Well, how about commercially? Well, okay, all commercially. And all that, that sort of thing is, is negotiation theater, which is unhelpful. And, and yes, and it's just, it, 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 you can, the pushback, it does waste time. Uh, so having the book allows you to say, uh, kindly have a look at section 13.256 of the fourth edition of Manual Style for Contract Drafting. Uh, it is, and by the way, it's sold zillions of copies and it's regarded and, and it is a cherished resource in the contracts community. So, so don't give us, you know, just, just read it and, and understand that our position is reasonable. So, um, so those are, those are two strategies. Um, you can also, I forgot, if, if you end up in an efforts discussion, if someone is insisting, no, I'm best, oh, it must be best efforts, you can say, hey, we want to do this deal, but, um, so if you insist, we'll sign it, but just be aware we don't have a meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and the broad as always the broader point is it's best not to not to get into debate over stuff that doesn't matter so mm -hmm. when you're reviewing the other side's draft you're not going to try and turn it into a thing of beauty if people insist on putting putting stupid stuff in your draft and you really you really want to do the deal and what they're asking for isn't going to affect your interests or, or how or, or how the how the the transaction is expressed in any meaningful way then oh, then go ahead on the other hand if you're in the business of selling zillions of widgets and thousands of transactions and you have the clout you just say please stop annoying us we have widgets to sell we don't want to spend time dickering so no, bottom line is there's no magic fix, um, but I think there's enough leverage in terms of the book and, and strategies you can use uh, to, 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 to uh, push back on, on uh, that sort of annoyance to, to put you in a decent position. Well, so let's say that I'm persuaded that things are bad, that it matters in my ability to deliver for my clients, that it could cause costs in the future that could even cost me. Let's say I'm persuaded by that and I decide I want a systematic way to fix that. It's easy to say lawyers are bad at this, but getting good at it is another issue. And maybe the way to think about this is to think about um, if you've got an associate, right? How do you create a training program, a structure for that person to become demonstrably better at the thing they do without spending too much time on what's esoteric. So what do you think are some principles to create a training program for yourself or for an associate? Okay. I think being systematic about it helps. Um, I, I don't know where things are in the world of mentoring these days. Um, I would tend to, uh, if I were, uh, I don't know, in the position of, of either being uh, new or having people under me, I'd, I'd look to mentoring to uh, as more a kind of workplace environment and career management sort of thing, rather than please train me in how to, uh, how to wrangle contract pros. I think that the latter task is easier ultimately. 
Um, so I'm trying to put together, I mentioned the, the, an ecosystem uh, to, uh, to appeal to different, different needs. So you, you want the book, you read the book, okay, you can handle yourself fine. You want some, uh, you want some guidance, then there's a, the, 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 the day long in-person seminar, if we ever get back to those or the online version, if you want something, if, but if you're more interested in, in gaining control faster and, and making more progress than you would on your own, then I have my master class uh, program consisting of eight one hour weekly live sessions with supporting materials in terms of uh, automated quizzes, um, reading, assignments, you know, you, I ask people to, to redraft these two extracts, send them to me, and then I show them my version. And then during the sessions, I say, okay, categories of contract language. Here is a big company set of standard terms, which I, if I've highlighted some problematic verb structures. Let's go through. You tell me what you think the problem is and how we might fix it. So the hands-on component, I think, gets people farther along and helps them just get a better sense of what's what's involved. So, so becoming an informed consumer um, is, it becomes easier to, to uh, attain. And, I, and I'm, I'll be working on a purely on-demand version of that. Video clips, watch a video clip, do the reading, do the quiz, move on to the next one. And it can ultimately, uh, I would like to be involved in creating um, an online repository of materials for teaching at law schools and at business schools, uh, because currently it's a, it's something of a free for all with people people teaching you know kind of a, more of an M and A related course or just offering war stories or uh, hey let's teach boilerplate so um, just a systematic ecosystem uh, of, uh, and it's structured in a way to make it as accessible as possible, making use of, of the online learning platforms that have become quite nifty. So, mm -hmm. so, that, so that, that is uh, readily achievable by now and, and will become only more so uh, if, if I have my way. So speaking of yours, um, as we pivot to that, I, I, you know, I don't want to be an infomercial for your course specifically, but if people are taking seriously the idea that they need to get better at this, um, I guess first I would ask, what are some other resources that you would mention? And then with that context, tell us why your course is different and what you tried to address that was missing in that ecosystem. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, it's a, the, the um, I too am not eager on keen on the infomercial side of things. It's rather, uh, it's rather an interesting business having a sh a shop front for the first time. Selling books is like you know, the American Bar Association sells the books. I, it's not something I pay attention to. Uh, um, whereas uh, having an online course does require more attention. The the awkward reality is that I have this field essentially to myself. I don't really quite understand how that plays out. It's, it's everyone else is too busy running the copy and paste engine to have time for this. I think it's just, I'm for, I don't know, it's just, it's just, I, I, um, I've recognized that I come from something of a line of, 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 obsessives who um, who just fasten on to uh, a, a, a topic and just do it. I have a, a grandfather, uh, Arab scholar, uh, produced a you know, 1930s classic, Islam and Modernism in Egypt. Um, uh, so that's a long way from his uh, mid-Pennsylvania farm boy roots, but he was just driven. Uh, similarly, I'm driven to do this uh, because I, because I, I, 
I want there to be order. I want efficiency in a, in a non-fascist sort of way. I just hate waste. I hate confusion. So I'm going to try and, and uh, bring order to a small corner of the world. And no one else has had that drive to anything like the extent, which is why it's just been my playground. And I am still, I'm still coming up with stuff like, uh, oh, I wrote about uh, a post about the phrase hereby instructs, which has all sorts of interesting categories of contract language issues buried into it. And I've been doing this for 20 years and ha, ah, another wriggling specimen for me to write about. So it's my turf and no one, no one uh, do, no one has offered, created the materials like I do. And so they can't offer the training that I do. Again, I don't, this isn't, I say this with an element of regret. Um, I, I didn't, I mean, I'm just trying to do the best I can in my corner of the world and I'm the only person. And furthermore, it's, it's awkward because as I've said, um, training isn't enough. People will say, oh, can you recommend sources for contracts? You know, where can I get good commercial contracts? And I have to say, you can't. I mean, all credit to, uh, to Law Insider. It has uh, kind of democratized the process of rummaging through the, the grand flea market that is Edgar. But that is not optimal an optimal that, that, that doesn't lead to an optimal contract process without a whole lot of work that most people do not have the appetite for. That's why, that's why I regard training in contract drafting. You know how to the how to say it stuff means that that um, indulging in uh, getting a sense of my view of the world is sort of like uh, eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, a kind of you know, Western concept, uh, the, the most obvious instance of it being uh, Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden. Um, when you eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the, 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 the immediate consequences are not good. Um, you, look, you look around at the world and you see, you see the world for the first time and you see that it is not pretty. Um, and that's sort of what happens when you, when you become aware of my view of optimal contract language. But I think it's, if we're going to progress, that's what we have to start with, rather than just obliviously riding the copy and paste train and hoping for the best, but meanwhile, wasting all sorts of resources. Uh, so um, if there, but to, to harken back to, um, an initial question about AI taking jobs and all that. Um, I wouldn't be averse to, to having fewer people involved in contract drafting. I would like there to be ultimately be a, a repository of, oh, a library of automated templates where you can go for your first take on a particular contract instead of having people endlessly uh, reinventing the wheel. So if there were fewer wheel in reinventors, I'd be okay with that because because I, it's just it's a little demoralizing to think that okay we're going to rely on we uh, just reinventing wheels as an economic engine. Uh, let's 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 there's plenty of other stuff people can usefully do and uh, the the the. the Working with contracts, I mean, okay, I'm the contract drafting guy, but I find the traditional process of creating contracts kind of demoralizing myself. I, I don't, I don't relish it. I, so, um, so there we go. I'm free associating now. So. Well, so if people want to, and we're going to close this. Larry Weiss asked a question that I, I think would be useful to close with. Uh, he asked, what are three specific issues that you see in poorly drafted contracts that you would recommend we practitioners work on fixing? So to give a, maybe a, a top three um, you know, things to attack. Uh, but if people want to reach out to you, learn more about the course, learn more about you, ask you more questions, where, where should they go for that? Yeah, um, adamsdrafting.com uh, 
um, has links to you know my various activities. Uh, so you can and you can readily get hold of me. I'm alarmingly reachable. If uh, if anyone has any particular questions, so um, yeah, and there's a home page for for masterclass at courses.adamsdrafting.com. Uh, now, in terms of three things, that's again, I'm I'm the 3,452 tips guy. So, so three things. Um, well, number one would be um, categories of contract language because it not only relates to how you just say clearly whatever you want to say, it also has a big say in what you're saying. Because uh, just, okay, which verb structure do I use? That determines what you're saying. Um, you might think you're saying something, but oh no, that the way you said it is you're saying something completely different. Um, so I don't, I, I mean, I think going on to pick another random couple, two, I, hey, hey, of course, efforts is just look at my law review article and, and, a long time readers will know I'm something, I have been something of an obsessive over the phrase represents and warrants, which is just colossally odd. And there's a law review article from 2015 on my website that will tell you everything you need to know on the subject. Those are some you know, pet topics. But beyond that, just realize that, that everyone is riding the copy and paste train and things are, things are just I, uh, astonishingly suboptimal and random, no matter how prestigious the organization. All sorts of smart people at prominent or companies and law firms churning out stuff that just makes you, you want to hold it kind of, you know, with your fingers and drop it into a waste. Uh, basket. Um, so just realize the world is imperfect. And, uh, and also one advantage of training for those people who are around the world now, I did a, a session for the Nigerian Bar Association section uh, of business law. And I observed that with just you know, uh, diligent study of my book, you can be better equipped than all sorts of people in you know American and English and other organizations, who are who might have uh, credentials and and pedigree that you envy, but nevertheless they are not informed consumers, and you can you can be better equipped than they uh, without a whole lot of work. Well, that is helpful, and I appreciate you taking the time, Ken. It's it's obviously it's difficult for you because you've been so steeped. Uh, on, on these issues for, for us to condense it. But I like the idea that training is the answer, uh, taking that time to learn better. Uh, it, it, people are asking questions about some specifics like force majeure, which I think is really relevant. Uh, it, it, uh, is the best place to send people to the blog? Yes, search for force majeure on my blog. You'll find all sorts of stuff. There's plenty of stuff that isn't in the book, which is just about how, how to say stuff clearly. The what to say part, I have extra stuff on indemnification, force majeure, uh, consent to jurisdiction provisions. There's about two and a half thousand posts. Uh, search for any topic. There's a fair chance you will find something. If, there's, if you don't find something, you want my, me to have a take on something, you have a juicy tip uh, to some case or other, or, or you have a nagging question, um, I, uh, I, I welcome that kind of input. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, guys, uh, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Remember, we do these conversations every first and third Thursday. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have an in-house attorney talking about how she deals with employment issues uh, in her drafting. So I hope you guys will join us for that. Uh, make sure that you follow Ken and reach out to him. Uh, you can find, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's, it used to be something preposterous. My daughter mocked me. Now it's plain old at Adam's Drafting. Perfect. And uh, mine is at Mike Whalen Jr. I hope you guys will follow us there. Stay after this is done to answer the survey. We'd really like your feedback. As you can see, we're trying to add different 
types of content. We're trying things to give you guys a sample of what you might want to get from us. You are welcome to give that feedback and to be contributors yourself. Just email community at lawinsider.com. We can continue the conversation. Thank you, Ken. Thank you all. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.